I refer to it as a time of fall refreshing. Just as God brings change, so often we too need some change. Um, and I love to be blessed by good preaching just as much as you love to be blessed by good preaching. And well, something else that you need to be aware of is that the scripture says that God has gifted and called people in different areas and in different ways. And one of the ways uh, that God calls people sometimes is he calls them to be a pastor. And that's what I am. I'm a pastor. Michael Mason has been called to be an evangelist. That's the position that God has given him. And when you, when you look at it in Scripture, he lists out all these positions that God has called and equipped people to be. And he uses every one of them for the building up of the church. And if you take away one of the stones, one of those positions, the church may be missing some. And so something that I do every year since the Lord has called me to be the pastor of this church is I have asked Brother Michael Mason to come and to speak a word to us. To help come and to lift this body up, to equip this body for the ministry that God has prepared for Show Creek. And what's even better about it is that he's a homegrown man. <laughs> he's from here. Yeah. And what an awesome blessing it is that God has gifted this body, this community, this area with such a wonderful man. And so, Brother Michael, would you come and allow me to pray over you before you deliver the word? Amen. pray. Yeah. Father, I come to you and I just want to thank you. I thank you for my, I thank you for the gift that you've given him. And I ask now by the power of your Holy Spirit that you will truly set captives free this morning. Amen. That you will do what you said you were going to do. You came to seek the lost and the sick. Father, move today in a powerful yeah. way. Use him as a, a tool for your glory and your kingdom. In Christ's name I pray. Amen. Well, amen. You're glad to be in church. Would you say amen to that? Amen. It is a joy to be here today. I love you, Pastor. Do you like him? Amen. amen. I really do. I love him and I like him too because he's big enough to hurt me if I didn't like him. <laughs> <laughs> That's just the honest truth right there. And every time I preach here, I'm reminded that he's tall like Lurch or something because here I am again. <laughs> Good to see everybody this morning. Thank you for coming out. Appreciate you being here. <laughs> I do love this church. Many, many moons ago, I was not only looking for a church, I was in the midst of changing denominations. And I remember talking to my friend Junior Hill. He said, if you want to join a good Baptist church, you go join Show Creek Baptist. And I did that back in 1989. This church blessed me licensed me, ordained me into the ministry. I went off to New Orleans not long after that. Uh, but this is where I began my Baptist journey, if you will. And I thank God for you. I thank God for the privilege to preach here today. And I do appreciate your pastor. It's good to have my wife Dawn with me and one of our grandchildren, Magnolia. We have seven of those. And any offering that you could give us during Christmas would be greatly appreciated. <laughs> because we have the fearful thought that there may be more grandkids to come and we could use all the help we could get. Amen. It is good to be here today. Go ahead and take your Bible. Open it up to Acts chapter 8. I'm going to begin reading there at verse number 26. Acts chapter 8, beginning reading at verse number 26. I know that God never needs any help doing what he does. But God, it seems, always, in most cases, uses people. God is going to use Philip. God can use me. And I think about in my life all those that God used to turn me to Christ. Now, it was God that did the saving. It was God that did the cleansing. It was God that did all the changing, but, but God used people to point me in the right direction. Do you remember when God used somebody to point you in the right direction? Do you remember somebody that shared their faith with you? Somebody shared the gospel with you. Somebody pointed you in the direction of Jesus Christ. You remember that? If you do, say amen. Boy, I do. I remember it well how that God used certain people to point me in the direction of Christ. How that God used certain people to, to bring about and stir up conviction in my life. God does the work, but he often uses people. And in Acts chapter 8, 
he's going to use a man named Philip to reach an Ethiopian eunuch. We're going to begin there at verse number 26. What a great passage. Acts chapter 8, 26. And now an angel of the Lord spoke to Philip, saying, Arise and go toward the south along the road which goes down from Jerusalem to Gaza. This is desert. And I don't know if you underline things in your Bible, but this is desert. It tells me that it's right in the middle of nowhere. Maybe you know what it's like to be smack in the middle of nowhere. And if you've ever been there, I can tell you that God can find you even if you're right in the middle of nowhere. If you're in a place that cannot be found on the map, God can find you wherever you are. God is about to find an Ethiopian eunuch. God is about to send Philip there, smack in the middle of nowhere, right in the middle of the desert. And there, if you will, God is going to work a miracle in verse 20, 27. So he arose and he went. It's one thing to know where you need to go. It's another thing to actually get up and go and do it, whatever God has called you to do. And so he knew where to go. He didn't know exactly what was going to happen when he got wherever it was that he was going, but he got up and he moved in the direction that God had called him. May we move in the direction that God sends us. Amen? He arose and went. And behold, there was a man of Ethiopia, a eunuch of great authority under Candace, the queen of the Ethiopians, and he had charge of all her treasury. He had come to Jerusalem to worship. Now, we have no indication that he actually worshiped when he got there. In fact, the reading that we find tells us that he was most likely turned away, either because he was not a Jew or because he was an Ethiopian eunuch. Either way, he was turned away. He was headed back. He had been to Jerusalem to worship. Whether or not he worshiped, we doubt that he did. He is on his way back. He was returning, verse 28, and sitting in his chariot, he was reading the Bible. Now, he didn't have all of the Bible, but he had enough of the Bible to read it and begin to ask questions. He was reading Isaiah the prophet. That part of Isaiah, most likely, that many of us are going to quote at Christmas time and especially at Easter, he's reading Isaiah the prophet. He is reading the Word of God. The Spirit of the Lord spoke to Philip and said, Go near. Run quickly, overtake the chariot. And Philip ran to him. And he heard him reading prophet, the prophet Isaiah. And, and in my mind's eye, there in verse number 30, I see him kind of running along beside the chariot. And in a loud voice, he cries out, Do you understand what you're reading? The eunuch responded, How can I? Man, this is difficult. I don't understand it unless someone guides me. Now, God could have done that by his own spirit. God doesn't need any help doing what he does but he often uses people. How can I unless someone guides me and helps me? And he asked Philip to come up and sit with him, and he did. And the place in the scriptures which he read was this. He was led as a sheep to the slaughter. And as a lamb before its shearer is silent, he opened not his mouth. In his humiliation, justice was taken away. And who will declare his generation? For his life is taken from the earth. And so the eunuch answered Philip and said unto him, I ask you, of whom does the prophet say this? Of himself or some other man? In other words, who is he talking about? I got to tell you that the eunuch had no idea who the scriptures was describing. And we are living in a day when there are those that don't even know who Jesus is today. We live in a world today, in an America, in a state called Alabama, in a county called Morgan, where there are those that do not know who Jesus is. They don't know about the cross. They don't know about the death and the burial and the resurrection. They don't know the story of God's love. They don't know about it. The eunuch didn't know about it, and we kind of get that. But my... We are living in a world today where many don't even know who he is. And so Philip opened his mouth. 
And beginning at this scripture, immediately, if you underline things, here it is. He preached Jesus to him. We really have no other message, amen? And all the songs today, and by the way, I was very blessed with all of this. There was one message, it was him. It was the Lord Jesus himself. We have no business in church singing songs that are not about him, amen? We have no business in church bringing messages to this, to this pulpit that are not about him. We have no business teaching anything that's not about him. And so he opened his mouth and immediately, right there, he began to preach Jesus to him. And so what all did he preach to him? He must have included the very thing that we saw at the beginning of the service this morning. He must have included the message of believing and repenting and being baptized. Because as they went down the road, the eunuch said to him, See, here is water. Right in the middle of the desert? you got to be kidding me. i got to believe God kind of zapped that into place. There it is. See, here is water. What hinders me? That's what I'm preaching this morning. The three words, what hinders me? He said what hinders me. What's keeping me from being baptized even right now? Philip said nothing. <laughs> if you believe with all your heart, what does that mean? It just means believing completely. If you believe with all your heart, if you completely believe, you can be baptized. And he answered and said, I do. I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. Do you believe that? Do you believe that he was born of a virgin and that he lived 33 years and never sinned? Do you believe that he was crucified, dead, and buried, and on the morning of the third day he arose? Do you believe that? Do you believe that one day he's coming again and that every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that he's Lord? Do you believe that? Well, if you believe that, then there's nothing hindering you from following him from trusting him, from knowing him, and doing as the Ethiopian eunuch did. He commanded the chariot to stand still. And both Philip and the eunuch, there's enough water that they went down into the water. And he baptized him. And now, when they came up out of the water, the Spirit caught Philip away. I don't know, I've been doing this for about 41 years. I would love to have a verse 39 at some point in time. It would scare you all to death, but man, I would love it. Man, that the Lord might just zap me away after preaching or after baptizing. He zapped him. He caught him away. And the eunuch saw him no more. And he went on his way rejoicing. Philip was found in Azotus. <laughs> Passing through, he preached in all the cities till he came to Caesarea. God doesn't need any help but he uses people God uses his word God uses the Holy Spirit God uses whatever necessary to turn hearts and to turn lives toward the Lord Jesus Christ himself I think about David God used a man named David Nathan to get to the heart of David David was living in sin David had been involved in immorality and the worst of sins you can imagine. But God sent a man named Nathan to knock on his door. I think about the house of Cornelius. Cornelius was the first Gentile convert. Cornelius was a lost man. But Cornelius and all of his house received the gospel. They heard the gospel. They believed the gospel because God sent a man named Peter. God sent a man named Nathan. God sent a man named Peter. And what we're reading today is God sent a man named Philip. God may send somebody to tell you just what you need to hear. Do you believe that? God may not only send you somebody from a pulpit. God may send you somebody in person. God may send somebody to tell you exactly what you need to hear, which is exactly what the Ethiopian eunuch was. God sent Philip to him. God may be sending me to you today. What is it that hinders you from knowing him? What is it that hinders you from following the call of God on your life? 
I think it is a great question that the eunuch asked that day, but it's a great question for me to ask myself today. What is it that hinders me from doing what God has told me to do? What is it that hinders me from going where God's been telling me to go? What is it that hinders me from changing in the way that God has been convicting me about change? What is it that hinders me from praying like I need to be praying? What is it that hinders me from being interested in the Word of God like I used to be? What is it that hinders me from being a part of the body of believers, the house of God, the church of God? What is it that hinders me from following Him, from trusting Him, from believing Him, from serving Him? What is it that hinders me today? That was the eunuch, uh, the eunuch's question, but, but it ought to be mine. What is it that stands between me and trusting the Lord today? And, and, and Philip said, nothing. If you believe with all your heart. Have you ever loved somebody with all your heart? I love you with all my heart. I got to tell you, it would be a terrible valentine if you got one that said, I love you with most of my heart. I love you with some of my heart. I got to tell you, fellas, if you give your wife a valentine that says, I love you with most of my heart, you're going to wind up eating your own candy. I just got to tell you that right now. I love you with some of my heart, but not all of it. Philip said, if you believe with all your heart, it means trusting him completely. It means believing him completely. What Philip did not say was this. Philip did not say, if you will understand with all your mind. I'm still there. I'm still finding things in the Word of God I don't understand. Anybody else? I'm still finding things in the Word of God that blow my mind. And I'll say to Dawn in, a, in an early morning Bible reading, I've never seen that before. I wonder what that means. Even this morning I had a question and I thought to myself, how do I preach that? How do I reconcile that? I don't know what that means. He didn't say, understand with all your mind because if that's one of the qualifications, I can't trust the Lord because there's so much that I don't understand. But he did say, believe with all your heart. Do you believe? It's not about understanding at all. Billy Graham was asked in his early 90s if he could go back and, and do one thing differently. What would he do different in all of those 70 plus years of ministry? What would he do different? And Billy said, I would study the Bible more. <laughs> he didn't get it. Even in his early 90s, he knew that he had missed some things. If you believe with all your heart, it's not about understanding with all my mind, but it is believing enough that I'm willing to get up and go in the direction that God is calling me. It means that I'm willing to go and do the thing that he's called me to do. It means that I'm willing to change in the way that God has called me to change. It is because I have believed with all my heart. What is it that hinders you? Man, over the past 40 some odd years of preaching the gospel and trying to get people in church and trying to get people saved, I've prayed with so many people at altars like this and invitations in churches far and wide. And time and time and time again, the answer is I know what I need to do, but I'm just not ready. What is it that they're not ready for? I believe often it is I am not ready to give up my lifestyle. I am not ready to turn from my sin. I am not ready to do what God is telling me to do. I know what I need to do, but I'm just not ready. I tried to make up a list or write down a list sometime back of many of or all of the excuses I've heard over the years of the reasons people were not in church or not right with God or not walking with God. And it was at least a page and a half. And so you'll thank me today. I've kind of whittled it down to a half a page of excuses and things that I've heard over the years that hinder people from being right with God. And this is what I discovered a long time ago. The two 
greatest reasons why people are not in church as they need to be are sunshine and rain. How y'all doing out there? It's too rainy. We don't need to get out. It's too bad. We'll just stay in the... And next Sunday, it's too pretty. Man, what a beautiful day. We need to get out and enjoy it. Sunshine and rain. The music is too loud. Y'all with me on that? And I said it with that look on my face because that's the way I've heard it. It's too loud. And then I've heard it's not loud enough. The pews and the chairs are too hard. I've heard, honestly, I ain't making it up. They're too soft. I'm just not getting fed. You ever heard that one? You can't feed people that are not hungry. You'll never force feed anybody. My mother used to tell me when she was cooking supper, back in the days when my mother cooked supper, she'd say to me, don't you fill up on junk. You're not going to be hungry for what I'm cooking if you're filled up on junk. And i got to tell you, I really believe today the reason that many of us are not hungry for the Word of God is because we filled up on junk. I've worked too hard this week. There's too many new people. <laughs> you don't ever hear there's too many old people. There's too many new people. It's too crowded. I don't have anything to wear. I got to tell you, and I'm preaching since COVID in the churches and revival meetings, this I don't have anything to wear just does not fly. <laughs> if you've got clean pajamas and a pair of Crocs, you're good to go. <laughs> SpongeBob Crocs, that's what she had on. <laughs> there's too many preachers on tv anyway i can watch some of them all they talk about is money they're having a guest preacher the preacher preaches too long he's too old wait a minute did i hit a nerve there <laughs> the preacher preaches too long okay no, these are not worthy of I an mean, amen now. Settle down. Don't be looking around. He's too old. He's too young. He's too loud. Okay. <laughs> he speaks too soft. He doesn't wear a tie. <laughs> he wears a tie. He moves around too much. It's too cold. It's too hot. I don't like somebody that goes there. All right, then. We'll move them out so you can come. <laughs> the service is designed for old people. They cater too much to the young folks. My alarm didn't go off. I needed to mow the yard. The preacher directed his sermons at me. The church did me wrong about 20 years ago. I overslept. I hadn't got to see my family much this week. I stayed up too late. My car wouldn't start. The fish are biting. The deer are moving. I felt like I was getting sick. I needed to pick up some things at Walmart. There's nobody there my age. It's boring. I'll go to church after I stop drinking. I encouraged him to go ahead and start while he was still drinking. Yeah, I guarantee you. Go ahead. Don't wait until you stop drinking because you may never stop without his help. Amen. I'm not going to go to church, man. I'm, I'm doing this. I'm doing that. Come on to church. Jesus came not for the righteous, but for the sinner. He didn't come for those who were well. He came for those who were needed a physician. I didn't get up in time. I belong to the 700 Club. The choir isn't all that good. My family never went to church when I was a kid. My baby won't stay in the nursery. They stand up too much. They don't sing hymns. They won't sing choruses. I don't have a Bible. I needed a day off. Somebody corrected my child, and I'm telling you, somebody sat in my seat. 
<laughs> now, all of those are things I've heard. And all of those are kind of funny, but they're kind of not because they're so petty. They're so silly. And if I wasn't in church, I'd just say, they're so stupid. Just stupid reasons to keep somebody out of church. What hinders you? I think it's a great question. I preached this a few weeks ago. And in the motel room that night, the next morning, I kept asking myself, what about you, preacher? What is it that hinders you? Why are you not walking with God like you know you need to? Why are you not closer to him than you, than you are, than you have been? Why are you not reading your Bible? Why are you not hungering after God like you once did? What is it that hinders you? Oh! of those reasons are kind of funny and yeah we ought to laugh a little bit at ourselves but man I need to take a self a, a really a self portrait of myself and look into the word of God what do I look like I must examine myself I need to take an examination and a good look at me what's hindering me the Ethiopian unit was hindered because of where he was. He was 12 to 1,500 miles away over in Ethiopia. And a round trip is going to be somewhere around 3,000 miles. And if he travels 10, 12 miles a day, man, that's going to be a long journey. Think about all that he's going through. Think about all the distance between he and where he wanted to be. And think about arriving there and being turned away because he's a eunuch. And now he's on his way back. Imagine him still searching the scriptures. Imagine him. God is drawing him. God is dealing with him. God is convicting him. God is calling him. God is bringing about his salvation. But the eunuch needs some help. He needs somebody to explain the scriptures. He's, he's hindered because of where he is. I've got to believe he came to the right place and for the right reason with the right attitude. He's where he needs to be. 1,500 miles from home. And he arrives there desiring to know God, desiring to hear from God, to start desiring to understand what he can understand. He's there. You may be in the right place this morning, the house of God. You might be in the right place. You might be here for the right reason with the right attitude. But what is it that hinders you? Distance. And even though in this story, it's literally 1,500 miles. May I just ask you practically this morning, how far are you from the Lord? And maybe the better question is, how close are you? How far am I from God? Man, I remember when I had a hunger for his word. Man, I remember when I was serving him. And there may be those today, you've walked away from your calling. Man, I remember when I was loving God, serving God, believing God. Man, I had a heart for the things of God. But, as the story goes, something happened. But, Something happened in the church, something happened in my home, something happened in my family, something happened in the marriage, something happened in me. Man, I was walking with God, but something happened. Yet the question is, how far are you from God? But the better one is, how close are you? And what hinders you from being closer? I got to tell you, in most churches today that I've preached in, the biggest thing that separates people from God, the biggest sins are not necessarily sex, drugs, and rock and roll, but the biggest sins are those of bitterness and unforgiveness and jealousy and pride. It's easy to preach on sex, drugs, and rock and roll, but when you start preaching on forgiving one another, we put up a wall. It's kind of invisible, but we put up a wall. I know I need to forgive. I know I need to apologize. 
I know I need to do what's right. What is it that separates you from God today? What is it that hinders you from knowing Him? And what is it that hinders you from knowing Him better? It was distance, 3,000 miles. He had to make up his mind. I'm going to make a 3,000-mile round trip that I might know God. But not only was it the distance that hindered him, it was also the difficulty of getting there. This is desert. Hard. A hard journey. This is desert. No water. That brings on water except for this pond that God zapped into existence when the eunuch was ready to be baptized. No water. Hot. Heat beyond anything you can imagine. A hard, difficult journey. He's not traveling by himself. It's as if he has an entourage with him. They're traveling through desert day after day after day after day. How weary they must have become. The difficulty of getting where you need to be. It hinders us. I know what I need to do, but it's going to be hard. I know where I need to change, but it's going to be hard. I know what I need to say, but it's going to be hard. And listen, God may be calling some of us to a foreign mission field today. He may be. But God may be calling us to, to, to go across the road to our neighbor. God may be calling us to go home to our mother and dad and speak to them because we hadn't spoken to them in months. God may be calling us to travel 3,000 miles. God may be calling us to make a phone call. And it'll be difficult. But it's the thing God's telling you to do. Is anybody with me out there? Distance? How far am I from where I need to be? The difficulty of getting there. Oh, it's going to be hard. I know what I need to do, but I'm just not ready. Oh, I know where I need to go, but I'm just not willing to do that. Oh, I know. I know I need to give my dad a call. Oh, I know I need to apologize. I, I know what I need to do. If anybody ever told you that living for Jesus was easy, they flat out lied. Coming to know him is the easiest thing that you'll ever do. But living for him beyond knowing him is very difficult. It's a narrow way. Few find it and few stay on it. Amen? It's, it's a great distance. It's a great difficulty. And there are also dangers involved. I want to tell you that if you decide that you're going to go where you need to go, if you decide, like the eunuch, I'm going. It's a long way, and it's going to be hard. I want to remind you of what the great preacher Vance Havner said years ago. He said, whenever any man takes serious the things of God, he immediately becomes the target of the devil. Have you ever felt like you were the devil's target? This pastor knows if this church is pleasing God, it's like there's a bullseye on the rooftop. Say amen to that. This pastor also knows if he stands up and preaches what God tells him to preach, there's a target on his backside. If you've got a home that honors God, the devil's going to fire up all the artillery and shoot at your house. Anybody relate to that? You've got a marriage that's pleasing God, Devil going to do his best to wreck it. There's going to be a bullseye on the roof of your home. There's going to be a bullseye on your backside, Ethiopian eunuch, to keep, you from, to keep you from going where you need to be. Where is it that he's sending me? Where is it that he's calling me? What is it that he's telling me to do? And what is it that, it hinders, that, that hinders me? Not only was he hindered because of where he was, but he was also hindered because of what he read. The Word of God is sharp, quick, it's alive, and powerful. And some of the most disturbing things I've ever read, I've read in the Word of God. Can anybody relate to that? He's traveling down the road, and he's reading the Isaiah, the prophet, and he's troubled at what he reads. He doesn't understand exactly what he's reading. He's troubled at that. And may I just say today that the Word of God is a troubling book. 
It troubles us. God uses it to stir conviction and to point us in the direction we need to go and to call us to the thing we need to be doing. He read the scriptures. He's seeking God. He's seeking truth. And i got to believe he was seeking answers. I wish we knew more about him. I wish we knew more about the process that he went through to make the decision to go. I wish we knew more about what happened when he got back. We know a little bit about that. But man, I just wish we knew more as to what drove him to actually leave where he was and make a 3,000 mile round trip journey to get there. Philip was on a mission from God. About the time that the Ethiopian eunuch is arriving and leaving Jerusalem, God commissions Philip to go. The word of God is like a fire. Jeremiah chapter 20 verse 9 says the word of God is like a fire in my bones. Whenever I I, I stop and I cease to preach it and proclaim it, it's like a fire shut up in my bones. And friend, I'm so glad today that Jeremiah painted that picture. I'm glad that the Word of God is like a fire. I'm glad that it'll burn you, but I'm also glad to know that the Word of God will not only burn me, but it'll warm me if I've grown cold. There is the burning of conviction. There is the warming of the comfort of God's Word. And i got to tell you, in my life, I've needed both. Anybody else? Man, I needed the Word of God to comfort me. I needed the Word of God to warm me up. I'd gotten cold. I'd, I'd grown distant. I'd got away from God. And I needed the Word of God to warm me up. But I've also needed the Word of God to burn me with conviction. I've needed a strong Word. God, show me in no uncertain terms. God, deal with me. God, direct me. God, lead me. And God did all that. Faith comes by hearing. And hearing comes by a miracle that happens when the Word of God is spoken, preached, taught, sung. The Word of God's like a fire, but the Word of God is also like a hammer. Jeremiah also said that. And I'm glad that a hammer can be used to build up. We use it to build up. But a hammer is also used to tear down. How many times in my life has the Word of God been that hammer? Man, strongholds had developed in my life. But the Word of God, like a hammer, began to tear them down. And the Word of God, like a hammer, began to rebuild my life. Anybody know about the destructive power of the Word of God to tear down strongholds? And the reconstructive power of the word to rebuild your life, your home, your family, your marriage. Anybody know anything about that? And it is the word of God that saves. Not only is the word like a fire and like a hammer, but it's also like a sword. The word of God is like a two-edged sword. It cuts in both directions. It does the good work. It does the hard work. It does that which is easy and loving. It does that which is kind and often hurtful. I'm so glad for the Word of God in my life. I'm so glad when I was a a 19-year-old kid and I was on the back row of that youth conference. I'm so glad that God used the power of the Word to convict me of my sin. I'm so glad that, that God made it clear. I'm so glad that even though I didn't understand fully the consequences of it all, I understood fully what I needed to do, and I did, and I don't regret it one bit, giving my life to him as a 19-year-old kid, and living for him and serving him all these years, and I am so thankful that the Word of God still works like that, amen? He was hindered, the Ethiopian eunuch was hindered because of where he was, 1,500 miles from home. He was hindered because of what he read, the Word of God, and he didn't understand it. But most of all, I think he was hindered because of when he believed. He believed 
right in the middle of nowhere. I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. Well, how inconvenient. I mean, they're not even singing just as I am. Y'all with me on that? There's no choir. There's not even an invitation being given. He's just believing. God knows where you are. If you're in a mess, He knows where you are. He can find you in a mess. Man, I've made a wreck out of my life. God has sifted through wrecks before. Yours is not the first. Man, what a fool I've been. God knows how to find a fool. God knows where you are. And right out in the middle of nowhere, there's two things that he needed. A preacher and a pond. The preacher's on his way. He's in a hurry. God has sent him there, and he's on his way. But little does he know also, right down the road, God has prepared a pond. Do I really believe that God zapped a pond into existence? I don't know what to believe. I just know right in the middle of the desert there was water. He's a long way from home. I remember taking a bus ride from Israel to Egypt several years ago after a, a Holy Land trip. And i got to tell you, on that bus ride, I didn't see any water. None. The, the eunuch needed a preacher. God is sending him. The eunuch needed a pond. He needed water. God's digging the pond right now. God knows where you are, and God knows what you need. God knows where you are, and God knows what you need to hear. God knows where you are and what you need to hear. God is calling you, and God will supply what you need. Anybody believe that? Philip. God help me to be more like Philip. He's pursuing the chariot. Some would say, at least some of me and my buddies say, we are in the fourth quarter of our life. Well, I'd like to make it to overtime. Anybody else with me on that? I really would. I don't want to stop chasing or pursuing the chariot at any point that I can see just now. I am thankful for the life of Billy Graham that was lived before me. I'm thankful for right down the road, the life of Junior Hill and many, many others that have lived before me that didn't stop pursuing the chariot even when it would have been easy to quit. Just a few weeks ago, I was preaching up in Johnson City, Tennessee, and I met one of the nurses that helped take care of Billy Graham in the latter years of his life. He stayed, his shift was actually the weekend shift from Friday night until Sunday night. That was his shift. And I said, well, tell me something about Billy Graham. I need to know that you're never going to read in a book. He said, well, there we are. He said, most Friday nights and Saturday nights, we're sitting on the couch, eating an Arby's roast beef, roast beef sandwich and drinking an A&W root beer. And I said, there's got to be something better than that. He said, yeah. He said, not only were we watching TV and eating what we were eating, he said, that had to be the prayingest man I've ever been around in my life. He said, he's 90-something years old. And we're sitting on the couch watching TV and said, every 10 minutes, his name was Braxton. He'd say, Braxton, turn that down. We need to pray for that. And so he'd turn the TV down. They'd pray. They'd get back to the roast beef. Uh, 10 minutes later, Brax, turn that down. We need, to, we need to pray about it. He said, they'd pray again. Every 10, 15 minutes, Brax, turn that down. We need to pray again. I, I said, man, that blesses me. It blesses me to know that even in overtime, if you will, in Billy Graham's life, he's still a man that desires to know God. Oh, God, help us pursue the chariot until there's no pursuit left in us. Amen. He pursued the chariot. He presented, he preached the gospel. What all did he say? I don't know. All we know is he preached Jesus to him. Well, that's enough. Tell me the story of Jesus. Tell me about his birth. Tell me about his life. Tell me about his death. Tell me 
about the ascending. Tell me about the promise that he's coming back. Tell me that every knee is going to bow. Tell me all about there is no other name like his. Tell me. And it appears that he told the story of Jesus. God help me to keep telling people about Jesus because it is the story that changes lives. He pursued the chariot. He presented, preached the gospel. And he experienced the power of God. Right there in the middle of nowhere. A Jewish preacher presented the gospel to an Ethiopian eunuch. He was baptized in a pond in the middle of the desert. And became saved. Just as saved as any of us who were ever saved on Sunday morning in a Baptist church. Right in the middle of nowhere. Amen. God uses people. He doesn't need any help. I'm reminded of D.L. Moody. D.L. Moody shook two continents for the power of God, for the glory of God. He stuttered and stammered when he spoke. He had the equivalent of a fourth grade education. He was led to the Lord by his Sunday school teacher. God could have saved D.L. Moody without the help of a Sunday school teacher, but he used him. He used him, Edward Kimball, to go down to the shoe store where D.L. Moody was working. And he presented the gospel to Dwight L. Moody. And he was saved right then and there. He went on to preach all over the world. Thousands upon thousands upon thousands were saved at the preaching of Moody. A mighty man of God who couldn't speak well, who had very little education. But he was a tool in the hand of God led to the Lord by a Sunday school teacher that could have never imagined what he was doing. Oh, my goodness. I'm so glad, so thankful for all those who used, that God used to reach me. And I pray, Lord, today in front of all these people that nothing will hinder me from being the tool in your hand that you might use for your glory and for your purpose. Anybody interested? Anybody interested? Then the question is, the greatest question that I've been preaching for the last few minutes is simply this. If I'm really interested in being his, knowing him, serving him, living for him, pleasing him, if I'm really interested in that, then what is it that hinders me? What is it that's keeping me from being what I need to be for him? What's keeping you from being saved? What's keeping you from knowing him? Good question, amen? amen? Would you pray with me? Every head bowed and every eye closed.